Good morning to all of you. The topic which I will be covering is pathophysiology of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. I am Dr. Anjana Sharma, and I have come from a northeastern part of India, that is Assam. I am very new to this neuroautology. I am learning neuroautology, attending Balance Cone only. This is my third visit, uh, third. Uh, visit to balance con. So I'll be covering the pathophysiology of BPPV. Now, this is the first topic uh, on BPPV today. So just to highlight what is BPPV, it is a mechanical disorder of semicircular canal because of presence of an unwanted particle that is autolytic, deters from utricular macula coming into the circulation of the semicircular canal, rendering it sensitive to gravity Otherwise, it can sense only the angular acceleration. So if you look at the names, the condition is called benign because it has got a favorable outcome. It comes in paroxysm, means it occurs suddenly, and it comes in a spell of uh, vertigo, brief spells of vertigo. And it is called positional because the symptoms come in certain head position in relation to gravity, and almost it is, uh, all cases are associated with vertigo. I'll be covering this topic under the following headings, the theories of BPPV, neuroanatomy of semicircular canals and influence on extraocular muscles, that is the canalo-ocular reflex, which is the basis of all positioning tests and uh, I'll be covering the classical variety of posterior semicircular canal lateral, both canalolithiosis and cupulolithiosis, and anterior semicircular canals, and finally, some conclusion remarks. I'll not cover up the diagnosis and management part. That will be covered uh, by some other speaker. Now, coming to the theories of BPPB. The first theory of BPPP, that is cupulolithiasis, has been coined by Dr. Harold Suknak in the year 1962. He had demonstrated some basophilic particles on the top of the cupula, and in a person who died of some other reason, but he had a history of BPPV. So he thought that this heavy particle renders this semicircular canal sensitive to gravity. Here, that otolith particle is incorporated, in, uh, incorporated into the cupula in cupulolithiasis variety. The another theory, it's very popular theory, is canalolithiasis. Here, the otolith particles are circulating into the endolip of semicircular canal. They get details from the utricular macula coming into the semicircular canal, commonly the posterior semicircular canal, because it is the most dependent canal of all three canals. So normally the specific gravity of the endolymph and the cupula are same. That's why we cannot sense the gravity. So when this autolytic particle with a weight come into the circulation of the endolymph, the specific gravity of the endolymph will change and it will drag the endolymph along with the cupula when, while doing the positioning maneuver and there will be the movement of the sterocilia kinocilium and action potential will be generated in the hair cell and patient will feel the vertigo. Coming to the neuroanatomy of three semicircular canals and influence on extraocular muscles. We all know the eye is the window to the inner ear, so we can't avoid knowing the extraocular muscles and how it acts. So we have four recti, superior, medial, lateral, and inferior rectus. Superior rectus will pull the eye upwards, inferior rectus will pull the eye downwards, medial rectus will pull the eye towards the nose, lateral rectus towards the lateral canthus. We have two other muscles, that is oblique muscle, superior oblique and inferior oblique. Their attachment is such when the superior oblique contracts, it will cause intrusion of the eye. It will cause intrusion of the eye. That means it will pull the eye medially towards the nose and little downwards. 
And when there will be contraction of the infer inferior oblique muscle, sorry, when will, uh, what is the pointer like this is? Okay. So when there will be contraction of the inferior oblique muscle, it will cause the extrusion of the eye. That means upper pole of the eye will move away from the nose. So we should know the muscle uh, actions of the oblique muscles which will be required to understand the torsional component of the vertical canals. Now coming to the inner vision. So all the recti are supplied by oculomotor nerve, that is third cranial nerve, except the lateral lectus, which is supplied by the abducens side from the same side. Inferior oblique is also supplied by the third nerve, but the superior oblique is supplied by the oculomotor, uh, by the trochlear nerve from the opposite side. This is, will be the repetition of basic physiology, but we just can avoid. So, Semicircular canal fluid dynamics based on some laws. One is the Eval law one. What is this? The stimulation of a semicircular canal with respect to head causes eye movement in the plan of the canal being stimulated. For example, if we can stimulate the horizontal canal, the eye will move in the horizontal plan. And if we stimulate the vertical canal, that is anterior and posterior canal, the eye will move in the vertical plan. Now, second law, it is said that in the horizontal canal, the ampullopetal movement, that means endolymph flowing towards the utricle, will cause excitation. And for the vertical canal, it is quite opposite. Ampullofugal movement will cause excitation. Why it is so? It is because of the placement of kinocilium. For a horizontal canal, it is placed towards the utricle. So when there is a movement, ampullopetal moment in the horizontal canal, the sterocilia will beat towards the kinocilium, then ionic channel will open up and there will be depolarization. But in case of vertical canal, kinocilium is towards the canalicular side. So ampullofugal will, uh, of the uh, moment of endolymph will open up the channel and depolarization. So it is quite opposite for the vertical and horizontal canal. Now, just for the beginners like me, it was very difficult to understand what will be the position of semicircular canal in a normal anatomical position. And we, when we do positioning, then it is more difficult. If I can understand the one side of the canal position, then it, it was very difficult for me to understand what will be the position uh, of the other canals of, from, of the other side. So what I used to do, I, I could find out a software in the internet that is called Paint 3D. At least I can rotate the head with that software, the angle which I want, then we can see the, what will be the position of the can, particular canal. This picture I took from the book and uh, took a snapshot and put in that software, then I rotate the head this is the dix hall pike maneuver. Then I try to find out what will be the position of the posterior canal. So why we rotate the head 45 degree towards the uh, side to be examined? So we all know that we can stimulate the canal in its plan only. So when we rotate the head towards the side to be examined of, uh, in a case of posterior semicircular canal BPBB, uh, we, we keep the position in certain way that we can move in the plane of the posterior canal. <clears throat> so normally, when we, in the first step, the autolyte particle will remain towards the ampullary end. When we make the patient supine head down 30 degree, it will fall off. So it is a utricular side is this side. This is an ampullofugal movement. So it is a vertical canal. So there will be excitation, and patient will complain of nystagmus. Now, <clears throat> to cor correlate, what will be the eye movements? For the right posterior canal, 
BPPB. Now see the reflex arc. What is a reflex? In day-to-day -day activity, we need some immediate response, neuronal response. We don't need the cerebral cortex to act. So either it will act at the spinal cord level or brainstem level. So it has got a sensor, efferent neuron, then a center, relay center, and efferent arc, and the effector organ. Here the sensor is the crista of the semicircular canal, then the vestibular cochlear nerve, then relay center is the, the brainstem nuclei, then, then the effector organ is the extraocular muscles. So posterior canal of the right side would stimulate the superior oblique in the same side and inferior rectus on the opposite side. So what will be the movement of the eye? So inferior rectus will pull the eye downwards. Superior oblique will rotate the arch, uh, eye towards the midline. So we can call it the upper pull will rotate towards the, towards the left side. So this will be the slow component of the nystagmus. So what will be the slow component for right posterior canal BPPV? Downward and upper pole beating towards the left. <coughs> now, this is a case of right posterior canal BPPV. It is said that vertical component can be, can be best visualized in the opposite side and the torsional component is best visualized on the side examine. I will forward this video. For me, vertical component is easily visualized. It is upbeating nystagmus. So to get whether it is the upper port beating towards the right or left, let the nystagmus slow down, now you can make out. Beating towards the right. It is a right posterior canal, BPPV. Now coming to the left posterior canal, BPPV. Now look at the picture. Here, the superior oblique will rotate the eye towards the nose, means upper pole of the eye will be towards the right side. And then inferior rectus will pull the eye downwards. So the resulting moment will be downward and upper pole beating towards the right. So nystagma should be up beating and upper pole beating towards the left side. This is a case of left posterior canal BPPV. So, we can see that vertical component, component it is up beating. Let the nystigma slow down, then we can see the torsional component. So, it is torsional component is bit upper pole beating towards left side. So, resulting nystigma for left posterior canal will be upper pole beating uh, towards the left side and it will be up beating. So coming to the lateral canal, normally in supine position, the for canalolithiasis variety, the position of the otolit will be here in the long arm. So when we rotate the head towards the side affected, it will drag the endolymph towards the utricle. So there will be excitation 
uh, there will be uh, excitation, means the intensity of the nystagmus will be more when we rotate the hair towards the side of the lesion in case of canalolithiasis variety. But when we rotate to the normal side, what happened? This will fall uh, from the utricle, so there will be inhibition. So in a geotrophic variety, then what will be the nystagmus? See the circuit? The same sided, it will contract the medial rectus and opposite sided lateral rectus. So for right horizontal canal, I will be dragged towards the left side. Means it is in, Mac, uh, in macular pagnini, it will be away from the ground. So what will be the nist ultimate nystagmus? It will be towards the ground for canalolithiasis variety. Now, this is a case. of right horizontal canal BPPB. You can, you can appreciate the horizontal listing was beating towards the right side. So, now coming to the apogeotropic varieties of uh, lateral semicircular canal BPPB. So here, the autolyte particle will be incorporated into the cupula. So when we rotate the head towards the side of the lesion, it will drag the cupula towards, away from the uh, utricle. So the in intensity of the nystagmus will be low. But when we rotate the head, towards the side of the lesion, it will drag the cupula uh, towards the utricle. So the in, uh, intensity of the nystagmus will be more. So it is opposite for uh, canalolithiasis. In canalolithiasis varieties, when you rotate the heads towards the side of the lesion, the intensity of the nystagmus will increase. But in cupulolithiasis varieties, it is quite opposite. But Whatever may be, uh, whether it is on the uh, right side or left side, when we rotate the head towards the right, that it will drag the cupula towards the down. And if you rotate the head towards the right, left also, it will drag the uh, cupula towards the down, uh, towards the ground. So slow component of the eye will be towards the ground, and so nystagmus will beat away from the ground for apogeotic variety of lateral semicircular canal. BPPB. Now coming to the anterior canal, BPPB. Here also I took the help of this uh, software. This picture I have, I took a snapshot from the book and I tried to rotate then see how, what will be the position of the left anterior canal when we do this Holpike test, right this Holpike test. And you all know that to stimulate the left anterior canal, so we have to do right this Holpike test. So uh, in this picture, we can well appreciate that we are not only the stimulating the right posterior canal, we are also stimulating the left anterior canal as well. Now, what will be the resulting moment for right anterior, superior, uh, anterior semicircular canal BPPB by left Dix Holpike test? Now, uh, if you look at the innervation, uh, same sided superior rectus will be stimulated and opposite sided inferior, inferior oblique will be stimulated. Superior rectus will pull the eye up and inferior oblique will extrusion. Extrusion means eyeball will be rotated away from the nose. So it will, it will go towards the left side. So resulting moment, uh, slow component will be upward and upper pole meeting towards the left side. Now, what will be the ultimate nystagmus direction? It is down beating and upper pole will beat towards the right side. So for left anterior canal, now again the picture, inferior oblique will rotate the upper pole of the eye away from the nose, that means towards the 
sorry. Inferior oblique will rotate the eye uh, towards the right side, and superior rectus will pull the eye upwards. So slow component for left anterior semicircular canal BPPV will be upward and upper pull will be uh, rotated towards the right side. So ultimate nystagmus will be downward and upper, upper pull beating towards the left. Now, the finally to conclude, elicitation of nystagmus in different provoking tests is not sufficient enough to isolate affected canal. Proper orientation of three semicircular canals in three-dimensional space is a must in understanding BPPB. Understanding of canal ocular reflex of all three canals generated on positioning tests and their influence on six extraocular muscles will help in identifying the canal, side, pathology involved, and treatment outcome. Thank you. <laughs>